It was a Sunday morning in the very height of spring. George Bendeman, a young merchant, was sitting in his own room on the first floor of one of a long row of small ramshackle houses stretching beside the river, which were scarcely distinguishable from each other in height and coloring. He had just finished a letter to an old friend of his who was now living abroad, had put it into its envelope in a slow and dreamy fashion, and with his elbows propped on the writing table, was gazing out of the window at the river, the bridge, and the hills on the farther bank with their tender green. He was thinking about his friend, who had actually run away to Russia some years before, being dissatisfied with his prospects at home. Now he was carrying on a business in St. Petersburg, which had flourished to begin with, but had long been going downhill, as he always complained on his increasingly rare visits. So he was wearing himself out to no purpose in a foreign country. The unfamiliar full beard he wore did not quite conceal the face George had known so well since childhood, and his skin was growing so yellow as to indicate some latent disease. By his own account, he had no regular connection with the colony of his fellow countrymen out there, and almost no social intercourse with Russian families, so that he was resigning himself to becoming a permanent bachelor. What could one write to such a man, who had obviously run off the rails, a man one could be sorry for, but could not help? Should one advise him to come home, to transplant himself and take up his old friendships again, there was nothing to hinder him, and in general, to rely on the help of his friends. But that was as good as telling him, and the more kindly, the more offensively, that all his efforts hitherto had miscarried, that he should finally give up, come back home, and be gaped at by everyone as a return prodigal, that only his friends knew what was what, and that he himself was just a big child who should do what his successful and home-keeping friends prescribed. And it was certain, besides, that all the pain one would have to inflict on him would achieve its object. Perhaps it would not even be possible to get him to come home at all. He said himself that he was now out of touch with commerce in his native country. And then he would still be left an alien in a foreign land embittered by his friend's advice, and more than ever estranged from them. But if he did follow their advice, and then didn't fit in at home, not out of malice, of course, but through a force of circumstances, couldn't get on with his friends or without them, felt humiliated, couldn't be said to have either friends or a country of his own any longer, wouldn't it have been better for him to stay abroad just as he was? Taking all this into account, how could one be sure that he would make a success of life at home? For such reasons, supposing one wanted to keep up correspondence with him, one could not send him any real news such as could frankly be told to the most distant acquaintance. It was more than three years since his last visit, and for this he offered the lame excuse that the political situation in Russia was too uncertain which apparently would not permit even the briefest absence of a small businessman, while it allowed hundreds of thousands of Russians to travel peacefully abroad. But during these three years, George's own position in life had changed a lot. Two years ago, his mother had died, since when he and his father had shared the household together, and his friend had of course been informed of that, and had expressed his sympathy in a letter phrased so dryly, that the grief caused by such an event, one had to conclude, could not be realized in a distant country. Since that time, however, George had applied himself with greater determination to the business as well as to everything else. Perhaps during his mother's lifetime, his father's insistence on in having everything his own way in the business had hindered him from developing any real activity of his own. Perhaps since her death, his father had become less aggressive Although he was still active in the business, perhaps it was mostly due to an accidental run of good fortune, which was very probable indeed. But at any rate, during those two years, the business had developed in a most unexpected way. The staff had had to be doubled, 
the turnover was five times as great, no doubt about it. Further progress lay just ahead. But George's friend had no inkling of this improvement. In earlier years, perhaps for the last time in that letter of condolence, he had tried to persuade George to emigrate to Russia and had enlarged upon the prospects of success precisely George's branch of trade. The figures quoted were microscopic by comparison with the range of George's present operations. Yet he shrank from letting his friend know about his business success, and if he were to do it now, retrospectively, that certainly would look peculiar. So George confined himself to giving his friend unimportant items of gossip, such as rise at random in the memory when one is idly thinking things over on a quiet Sunday. All he desired was to leave undisturbed the idea of the hometown which his friend must have built up to his own content during the long interval. And so it happened to George that three times in three fairly widely separated letters he had told his friend about the engagement of an unimportant man to an equally unimportant girl until indeed, quite contrary to his intentions, his friend began to show some interest in this notable event. Yet George preferred to write about things like these rather than to confess that he himself had got engaged a month ago to a Fraulein Frieda Brandenfeld, a girl from a well-to-do family. He often discussed this friend of his with his fiancée and the peculiar relationship that had developed between them and their correspondence. So he won't be coming to our wedding, said she. And yet, I have a right to get to know all your friends. I don't want to trouble him, answered George. Don't misunderstand me. He would probably come, at least I think so, but he would feel that his hand had been forced and he would be hurt. Perhaps he would envy me and certainly he'd be discontented. And without being able to do anything about his discontent, he'd have to go away again alone. Alone? Do you know what that means? Yes, but may he not hear about her wedding in some other fashion? I can't prevent that, of course, but it's unlikely, considering the way he lives. Since your friends are like that, George, you shouldn't ever have gotten engaged at all. Well, we're both to blame for that, but I wouldn't have it any other way now. And when, breathing quickly under his kisses, she still brought out, all the same, I do feel upset. He thought it could not really involve him in trouble were he to send the news to his friend. That's the kind of man I am, and he'll just have to take me as I am, he said to himself. I can't cut myself to another pattern that might make a more suitable friend for him. And in fact, he did inform his friend in the long letter he had been writing that Sunday morning about his engagement with these words. I have saved my best news to the end. I have got engaged to a Fraulein Frieda Brennenfeld, a girl from a well-to-do family who only came to live here a long time after you went away so that you're hardly likely to know her. There will be a time to tell you more about her later, but today let me just say that I am very happy and as between you and me, the only difference in our relationship is that instead of a quite ordinary kind of friend, you will now have in me a happy friend. Besides that, you will acquire in my fiance, who sends her warm greetings and will soon write you herself, a genuine friend of the opposite sex, which is not without importance to a bachelor. I know that there are many reasons why you can't come to see us, but would not my wedding be precisely the right equation for giving all obstacles to go by? Still, however that may be, do justice seem good to you without regarding any interest but your own. With this letter in his hand, George had been sitting a long time at the writing table. His face turned toward the window. He had barely acknowledged, with an absent smile, a greeting waved to him from the street by a passing acquaintance. At last, he put the letter in his pocket and went out of his room across the small lobby into his father's room, which he had not entered for months. There was in fact no need for him to enter it, since he saw his father daily at business, and they took their midday meal together at an eating house in the evening, it was true, 
Each did as he pleased, yet even then, unless George, as mostly happened, went out with friends or, more recently, visited his fiancée, they always sat for a while, each with his newspaper in their common sitting room. It surprised George how dark his father's room was, even on this Sunday morning. So it was overshadowed as much as that by the high wall on the other side of the narrow courtyard. His father was sitting by the window in a corner, hung with various mementos of George's dead mother, reading a newspaper which he held to one side before his eyes in an attempt to overcome a defect of vision. On the table stood the remains of his breakfast, not much of which seemed to have been eaten. Ah, George, said his father, rising at once to meet him. His heavy dressing gown swung open as he walked, and the skirts of it fluttered around him. My father is still a giant of a man, said George to himself. It's unbearably dark here, he said aloud. Yes, it's dark enough, answered his father. And you've shut the window too? Well, it's quite warm outside, said George, as if continuing his previous remark, and sat down. His father cleared away the breakfast dishes and set them on a chest. I really only wanted to tell you, went on George who had been vacantly following the old man's movements, that I am now sending the news of any engagement to St. Petersburg. He drew the letter a little away from his pocket and let it drop back again. To St. Petersburg? asked his father. To my friend there, said George, trying to meet his father's eye. In business hours, he's quite different, he was thinking, how solidly he sits there with his arms crossed. Oh yes, to your friend, said his father, with peculiar emphasis. Well, you know, father, that I wanted not to tell him about my engagement at first. Out of consideration for him, that was the only reason. You know yourself, he's a difficult man. I said to myself that someone else might tell him about my engagement, although he's such a solitary creature that that was hardly likely. I couldn't prevent that but I wasn't ever going to tell him myself. And now you've changed your mind? asked his father, laying his enormous newspaper on the windowsill, and on top of it, his spectacles, which he covered with one hand. Yes, I've been thinking it over. If he's a good friend of mine, I said to myself, my being happily engaged should make him happy too. And so I wouldn't put off telling him any longer. But before I posted the letter, I wanted to let you know. George, said his father, lengthening his toothless mouth, listen to me. Come to me about this business to talk it over with me. No doubt that does you honor. But it's nothing. It's worse than nothing if you don't tell me the whole truth. I don't want to stir up matters that shouldn't be mentioned here. Since the death of our dear mother, certain things have been done that aren't right. Maybe the time will come for mentioning them and maybe sooner than we think. There's many a thing in the business I'm not aware of. Maybe it's not done behind my back. I'm not going to say that it's done behind my back. I'm not equal to things any longer. My memory's failing. I haven't an eye for so many things any longer. That's the course of nature in the first place. And in the second place, the death of our dear mother hit me harder than it did you. But since we're talking about it, about this letter, I beg you, George, don't deceive me. It's a trivial affair. It's hardly worth mentioning. So don't deceive me. Do you really have this friend in St. Petersburg?